spring of 2021, June 2021, and I was hooked from the time I went up there. Very first day I hopped off the plane. That's that. So just like as a gist, you've probably heard before that Alaska's big, but it may be hard to contextualize just how gigantic Alaska is. Just to give you an idea, oh, they say everything's bigger in Texas, but Alaska's got it. <laughs> so that, I mean, just to give you an idea, this, it's incredible. Thousands of miles top to bottom left, right? Or north, south, east, west. So just to give you an idea, that's incredible. So I worked and lived in a couple of different places throughout, but you can imagine traveling, when people ask me questions about Alaska, well, it's hard to answer that question because the climate in Minnesota is so different than the climate in Jacksonville, and the wildlife in New Mexico is so different than the wildlife in Illinois. I can't give you an answer overall, but this just kind of gives you an idea of the, the grand scale of the whole darn thing. So for your travels, if you ever decide to visit, it's you. Oh, by the way, just show him. Who's been to Alaska before? A bunch of you. Okay, great. So you probably know a lot about this whole, the idea of the scale of it, I suppose. It takes you hours to drive what you think is just the next town over. Uh, yeah, so that's an idea of it. Um, just to give you an idea of the state of Alaska to contextualize, because I, I, a person, am a geography person, I went out to work in Seward my first summer. And Seward, Alaska is in what you might call the armpit of the state. It's right about here or so, like right south of Anchorage, so right in the, like the top of the Gulf of Alaska. Just to help you contextualize, about two hours south of Anchorage. You fly into Anchorage, you hop on a road that takes you basically straight there to Seward, the Seward Highway, so my favorite drive I've ever done. Put that on your bucket list. <laughs> That's the general. So if you were to go up to Denali from there, it's going to be another you know, four or five hours or so. If you wanted to go to, I don't know, name your favorite place, Fairbanks or so, it's hours to drive from here, there, and the other thing. It's so vast and expansive. And I think that's one of those things that really attracted me to Alaska, just how darn big it is. So my first summer, I went up to Seward. I served at a restaurant. I didn't do anything that interesting. I have a lot of serving experience. I've probably served many of you in this room. Have I served anybody in this room before? Of <laughs> <laughs> cafe, sports page, yep. Indeed, I went up and served at a restaurant with my best serving skills. I made a ton of money, a ton of friends, and then I went on a whale watching tour at the end of the season. And it was over after that, you guys. <laughs> so this is my friend Charlotte and I. We're out there holding a block of glacial ice. They chop it up and they put this glacier ice or glacial ice in a margarita and they call it a glacierita. It's a fun part of the tour they offer. <laughs> and then we go out and we see a humpback whale after three margaritas, and then it looks like a whole skyscraper. I, it, was, <laughs> it was the coolest tour ever, and I was hooked. It was the first time I'd seen whales. Uh, the first time I'd seen sea otters, sea lions, puffins. Orcas and and I was just hooked and I couldn't get enough of it. So I'm talking to the naturalists or the deckhands that are on the boat Like you probably have a PhD and you've lived here your whole life, right? And they're all telling me the same thing No, I've got customer service experience. I've got a bachelor's degree and I just can't sit still and I thought <laughs> <laughs> You don't say <laughs> so, uh, Interesting, interesting So over the course of the summer, I just did some of the coolest stuff uh, this is another one of my good friends, Astrid. Her and I drove the Alaskan Highway, what is called the Alcan, which is the only road that connects Alaska to the lower 48s continuously. I drove the whole thing. We took a comically large chair and took pictures everywhere. It was a very fun event. That was the end of my summer with that whole thing. And I, so that was my wheels returning, but what I'm going to do with myself after this. Couldn't stand the idea of never coming back. And then... As we're, as we're along, we are fantastic with a very large chair. So this is a white horse in Yukon. And then I saw the Northern Lights for the first time in Talk, Alaska, right before we crossed the border. And I, I just knew I was going to have to come back. There's no way I could come back from all of this. So that, I mean, like one of the absolute milestones of my life so far was this. So then it got me thinking, well, now what? I have to come back somehow, right? got all this degree and all these student loans. So in January of 2022, I knew for a fact I wanted to come back to Alaska. I liked the title of what a naturalist ought to be. We were starting to come out of COVID. So I went, you, anybody heard of Indeed.com? The, oh, yeah. the most widespread job website you can think of. I typed in naturalist Alaska and Alan Marine Tours is the first job that came up. Naturalist in Sitka, Alaska. 
sure. I put my application in, I got a call in a day, an interview in a week, and a job acceptance in two weeks, in January 2022. Wow. And I like to say that like SIP could just pick me. This job just picked me in that in that way. So off to the Southeast Alaska I went. So Southeast is very different than the rest of the state. As I showed you on that map a minute ago, you know, just inlaying across the rest of the state, it's a very tiny piece. Um, if you've ever been to a place like like Minnesota or um, Michigan or something like that, you use like parts of your body to point to different things. Alaskans will use their hand like this, and they'll give you the idea on their hand. So this is the shape of Alaska, the Aleutian chain, and all. So I'm way down here on the thumb, like way down on the southeastern end, southeast Alaska, which will now be known as Southeast for the rest of this presentation. Southeast Alaska is way different. It is a temperate rainforest down there, so it is very very rainy. It is coastal, of course. Um, so it's got a lot of different wildlife opportunities and just different flora and fauna than any other place in Alaska. Very unique in a lot of ways. So, as you might be familiar with a couple of these names throughout here, Juneau, of course, is the state capital. Uh, what else would you have heard of? There's Ketchikan down here and Skagway and all that. Um, Sitka is out here on the outside, as we call it. Have you heard of the term the Inside Passage before? Okay, so there's a couple of major islands here. There's the three, the ABC islands, Admiralty, Baranoff, and Chichikov. And the Inside Passage is tucked up in between those large islands. So the Inside Passage is all of this. Well, Sitka, as you can see, is the only community of any real size that's not on the Inside Passage. It's exposed to the open ocean in a way that no other community is in Southeast. So we are very unique in a lot of ways, which is something I didn't realize at the time and then became, just made, sweeten the pot, if you will. <laughs> so Allen Marine Tours, the company I work for, we are a wildlife tour company. So we run marine tours. The whole focus is seeing wildlife and exploring Southeast. Anyone who's ever been to Southeast Alaska knows it is not a place you can traverse very well by car, really at all. You can't drive from place to place. You could try to take a plane, it's going to cost you a whole pocketbook's worth and the weather is really rough getting from place to place. So if you're going to go someplace for uh, exploration to take a cruise, Southeast Alaska is a great place as a cruise option. This is not, it's kind of a book, but this is, I mean, like it's just the best way to travel, to get from place to place easily, quickly, see lots of things along the way. So Allen Marine Tours is the company that I work for and we have ports in a couple different places. We've got one in Yakutat, which is way up there at the Hubbard Glacier. We've got one down in Ketchikan. We've got one in Sitka and Juneau, and another one, another small presence in Glacier Bay, which is in this region. I'm not so much sure. But anyways, so five locations for our company. Yakutat and Glacier Bay are a little bit on the smaller side. So three main ports. Ketchikan, Juneau, and Sitka. That's where I had my last two seasons. So I came on board as a naturalist, bottom of the barrel. I had never worked on a boat before. I didn't know if I got seasick or not. Turns out I don't, thank goodness. Um, and I didn't know if it would stick, but it did. So on the boat, what I do, my job is basically being the guide, the face of the tour. I am the person on a microphone that is giving you all of the information. Of course, there's a captain working very hard to drive, a deckhand making sure the engine is up and running, oftentimes there's a guest service person in our larger boats working in what we would call a galley, which is your little station in the back, or what have you. But the naturalist is the person giving the informational side of it. So in a way, it's just the voice of, of the tour, whereas there's legs working, there's arms working, I'm just the man. So it turned out that I absolutely love doing that because I'm a talker, so that's that. <laughs> and it worked out really well. This is the town of Sitka. This is the downtown area. So this first photo I took on my very first day ever walking around downtown. You see the Three Sisters Mountains in the background and Lincoln Street, for those of you who've been to Sitka, you know Lincoln Street is our downtown main hub. And this is Crescent Harbor in the middle of all of it. And most of Sitka kind of looks like this. No houses are taller than three stories. It's, it's adorable. It's a lot like Winterset in the sense of it's about the same size in terms of people about, how big is Winterset now? 5,000. 5,000? Okay, yeah, exactly about that. It's about maybe six or 7,000 in Sitka. Same, about the same size. I liken um, fishing communities a lot to farming communities in the sense of how it's been passed out from generation to generation. You know, blue collar people work very hard and really love their community around them. So it was interesting how much of a symmetry I saw between Winterset and Sitka. And it's just adorable in the way that our beautiful little town is. Um, so I loved it right off the bat. My first summer, this is the vessel that I worked on, the Sea Otter Express, and that's my crew. 
This is what it looks like from up top in a private tour that I took out on a boat one time. And it was like six, but we just hung out. It was so fun. And then this is what it looks like to sit inside down below. So you know, there's two stories there and a wheelhouse up top. It's just the idea. And about 95% of the passengers that we take on board come from cruise ships. So ships exactly like that one in the background there would be the ones that would get on our boat the large majority of the time or people that were just in town for the day. So I met a lot of people that are from, just like me, from places that are not like Alaska at all. And I found out very quickly that what I love to do more than anything is cross things off people's bucket lists. <laughs> and that just kind of became the, the bottom line for me and everything I do. So we go out, we take them on tours, we go do stuff. So the, but the vessel I worked on this year is a lot like this one, but the helm or the wheelhouse is a different place. It's up in the front. So my vessel this year looks more like the one on the left, where you, that's the view from up top. On the top deck, doing things, uh, out viewing and such. I really enjoy that you've got, that these vessels are well designed for everyone to see everything, no matter what, there's not a bad seat in the house. They're well designed for it. We do also have larger vessels that a lot of my friends, I worked on these a bit, but um, just other vessels within our company and other tours you might go on. Some are bigger, this is a 100 passenger vessel, just for instance, but the same sort of idea. We do wildlife tours, and we're happy to do it. Allen Marine is an indigenous owned company and we do build all of our own boats. So we build all our boats in the shipyard that's on the, that picture on the left. We build them all in Sitka. So for all the ports throughout all of Southeast, they are built right there in our shipyard in the town, which is pretty cool. So Bob and Betty Allen are the founders of our company. Um, they, uh, Betty Allen was indigenous. Um, so that was a cool start to all of that, the melding of the two cultures. And Bob Allen was very much an innovator. So his design for this jet boats, we, all of our vessels were jet boats. We did not have propellers. It was all using jet propulsion. Part of that was for the wildlife viewing portion of things. The whale happened to come up at any time. Boop, it bounced us on accident, which doesn't happen. But if it did, it wouldn't hurt them in some capacity. There's a couple other reasons for that. But this was his design that he patented. Like this, Bob Allen, which is pretty darn cool. Something we like to mention a lot. And then we'd go out and we'd show people how cool it is to be in Southeast Alaska. And, I, and I'm and i not gonna lie to you folks, I could go all day, I won't, I could, but there's just so much to see and so much to absorb. And like in this two pictures alone, I could go on and on and on. But a couple of things you might notice is how sheer the cliffs are in Southeast Alaska. The geology shoots straight up out of the water, very drastic angles because of the glaciers that were here during the last ice age, about 17,000 years ago or so. So they carve up these very steep angles, what you're seeing here is a left and a right photo of basically the exact same place. I, my screen messed around a little bit, but basically this is the same channel you're traveling through. And these two pictures meet in the middle here. Um, this is called Beehive, this channel. There's a hundred feet of water underneath us as we go through. And the width of the channel is probably about the width of this room. Isn't that insane? hundred feet of water underneath you still. So we can get very close to the sides of the mountain and explore the inner tidal zone, the geology, the forest, there's just lots to talk about. But the lichen even, you could go on all day, right? But um, our intertidal zone is huge. The swing between highest and lowest tide is about 14 feet. So on days when the, or times of the month where the tide is very, very low, you see all kinds of fun stuff. You see starfish, you see sea anemones, urchins, welts, all kinds of stuff. And then we go find some wildlife. <laughs> now, most of our tours are run with a wildlife guarantee in Sitka at least. We are required to show someone, uh, everybody on the boat needs to see either a whale, a bear, or an otter. One of the three, or we give you $100 back. <laughs> <laughs> we have not given that back to people in a very long time. We have one exception this year, that's a story we could talk about. But overall, generally speaking, it has been a very long time since we've done that because the wildlife is just dripping out of Sitka, it's incredible. These are stellar sea lions. They are not on that wildlife guarantee, but they're just fun and people love them. Has anybody seen sea lions before in your life? Okay, so in the Pacific coast, you've got your California sea lion, which you're probably familiar with. What sound does California sea lion make? It's a barking sound. Yeah, what's it sound like, Melody? No. <laughs> anybody else? What does it sound like? Like a whoop, 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 right? That's what it sounds like, kind of. It's more of a barking noise, exactly. In contrast, stellar sea lions make a guttural growl. It's like a sort of sound. Yes, I do it on the microphone. People love this. <laughs> and you can oftentimes hear it because they're just fun. This is so proper with the sea lion. So for instance, one of those things we stop by a lot. 
Sea otters are oftentimes what people really come to see because Sitka has a very high population of sea otters that a lot of other places in Southeast do not. There's a lot of reasons for it. Again, could go on all day, but the short and the long of it is that sea otters are everywhere throughout Sitka, and that's one of those things that really attracts people on our wildlife tours because they can see <coughs> whales elsewhere, they can see orcas elsewhere, they can see eagles elsewhere, but Sitka has the, uh, we have most of the sea otters you might find because you go along the cruise. So, it's one of our things, we like to talk about it. Um, sea otters, among other things, are very interesting because they do not have blubber. You know what blubber is? It's that layer of fat that insulates, keeps you warm, and most marine mammals have a layer of blubber, keeping them warm. Well, sea otters live their whole lives in the water. They sleep there, they eat there, they give birth in the water. So how do they stay warm if they don't have blubber? Have the best fur ever, you guys. <laughs> sea otters have the densest, <laughs> fur in the, the densest fur in the entire animal kingdom. This fur contains up to a million hairs every square inch. Imagine that a, a square inch, a million hairs. On my head, I probably have about a hundred thousand hairs in total. <laughs> they probably got a few to spare, so I didn't even know. But a million hairs per square inch means, so if you're going down through the sample, pass them around, give them a feel. You'll notice it's way softer than you would imagine a giant weasel living in salt water would be. They're a lot softer than you'd imagine. And if you go into that sample, you try to get between the hairs there, you'll notice you just can't do it. Doing a tick check on a sea otter? Forget about it. You couldn't do it. I can't make that joke in Alaska, but I can make it here. <laughs> you know, it takes Alaska. Uh, yeah, so just check it out. It's one of those things that makes them incredible. So Sitka was established as a Russian fur trading port. That was our humble beginnings, was sea otters, because we had a bunch of them. And as you can imagine, in the late 1700s, this fur was just completely priceless. It was more than necessary at the time. So the fur trade ensued. Long story short, they were overhunted to basically extinction and then brought back and reintroduced in the 60s. So nowadays, sea otter populations are top of dollar. They're fantastic. The populations are great, and they're now protected under the Marine Mammal Protection Act of 1972. Because you and I cannot go out and hunt and kill a sea otter. Legally speaking, there is one exemption to that, and it's the Alaskan indigenous people, mm -hmm. indigenous tribes. So there are a couple of these legal exemptions for folks in Alaska to practice their native culture. In the Sitka region specifically, the people are called the Clinket. Anybody heard of the Clinket before? You probably heard them on your cruise. Yeah, the Clinket people. Um, very fascinating culture, which is, by the way, still alive and well today. This is not an ancient thing. This is a real, a story in real time. Clinket people are alive and well today. Um, so the Clinket do go out and hunt and harvest sea otter fur. They've got to tag every individual they take, and they've got to do so in a culturally relevant, sustainable fashion. So if you purchase sea otter products in town, this is what I always tell people, if you purchase those products, number one, I can promise you're not harming the populations, and number two, you're supporting indigenous harbor. So I won't be mad at you if you do. <laughs> um, but we are a clinket owned company. Alan Marie is in our third generation of clinket family ownership, which is why we're able to have samples like this, which we do have on board our vessels for people to enjoy. And it's just one more element, helps you engage with your world around you a little bit better. It's having something, and as many senses as you can engage, all the better, right? As we know from being an interpretation. Yeah, you like a magic trick? <laughs> <laughs> and, they, and they're just so darn cute, you guys. Look at them. How could you? Okay, this is where I say, all these photos were taken by me, except for a few that Jim Lichty helped me out with. Thank you very much. And this is Jim Lichty's photograph. This is not mine. I'm allowed to take credit for this photo. Oh, no. Hello. Ruh -ruh. <laughs> Probably just getting loose. Come on, buddy. There you go. Yeah. Bam. A lot of times, what people come to Alaska for is the large marine mammals. And I have a wild superstition about saying the W word until we see one. So a lot of times people walk on board and they go, are we going to see whales? Are we going to see this? Are we going to see that? And I say, mm -hmm. Maybe it's all, there's always a chance. But we did see a whole lot of whales here up there, which is very cool. So you know that you're seeing a large marine mammal because you see a spout or what we call a blow, as you might be familiar. Whales breathe air, they don't breathe water, like Finding Nemo might have told you. So this is how we know that we have spotted one. We go over there, we watch it. Humpback whales are pretty much the species we see in Alaska. Humpback whales are the big one that we see more often than not. No, it's my alarm. Oh. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, uh, they come up to Alaska to feed. They come up to eat as much as they can. 
Has anybody seen whales down in warm water where they're splashing and they're throwing themselves out of the water all over the place? You've seen a little bit of that? So they don't do that very much in Alaska because that's just not the season. They're doing that attract that, that um, splashing surface active behavior to look attractive to a mate. They're trying to look sexy. And that's not something that they're trying to do when they're up in Alaska. They're eating more than anything, they're just gorging themselves, like most people on their cruise ship. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, more often than not, this is what we see when we watch whales. We see blows, we see tails. What is a whale tail called? Fluke. A fluke, absolutely. You studied, didn't you? <laughs> uh, yep, exactly. So we see a lot of flukes for anything. That's the, this is the big picture for a lot of people. Um, and it's just one of the most incredible things, being in the presence of whales. Just so interesting. I've got lots of facts about that. I'll tell you over a beer sometime. <laughs> but essentially, there's, there's just so much to talk about with them. And that's really one of those things that a lot of people who are um, coming up to Alaska as the last thing they ever hope to do with their life for whatever reason or other, that's what they're coming to see. This is the main thing that I absolutely love showing people on our boats because whales are just that sort of thing that really gets to a person's heart. So very special, very, very cool. And every now and again, we did see a little bit of this. Now, there, well, uh, breaching is not well understood by science, but a couple of reasons they might, other than reproduction, would be for stress, eventually. They could also do it as a play behavior, or if a mother is teaching her calf. So a lot of time, more often than not, whales have, are exhibiting behaviors that are learned. Meaning, what that means is they were born knowing that. They had to figure out how to do it. So their mom had to teach them how to do it at some point or other. So a lot of times when we see whales breaching, we'd see a mother and a baby together, and they would back and forth, which is so interesting to see. It's always special for the little ones. The little, when a humpback whale is born, it's about 13 feet long and about 2,000 pounds, about the size of a pickup truck, <laughs> <laughs> which is, you know, a small whale, but large animal even still. And just, I mean, the splashes they make are just incredible. So this photo is also one that Jim Lichty sent me. Thank you very much because all of my footage was on my phone and it was all videos and it didn't translate to this very well. So I had a little help with the footage, but this indeed was there, which was just priceless, incredible. We did see a lot of bears, I would say a lot. During the salmon run, towards the last third of the season, we see a lot of bears. And at least on the island where I worked, we saw brown bears. Now there are black bears and there are brown bears. We didn't have any black ones, we just had brown. Coastal brown bears specifically. I did take both of these photos. I was telling mom and dad this at dinner tonight. Yes, I did get very close to this bear, but I was on a boat and I did it safely, I promise you. <laughs> and then this, this was not on tour, this was casual. This one was from a tour and she's got three cubs with her. You can see one and then two and three are together back there. And, and that, was, that was, anybody seen Brother Bear before? Yes. Brother Bear, okay, we watched a lot of Brother Bear when I was a child, and the kid, the cubs' names are Sitka, Denahi, and, oh gosh, what's the last one's name? Sitka, Denahi, Keon. Anyways, all authentic Alaskan names. Okay, one of the other things that makes Sitka really unique is that we've got volcanoes, and there aren't a whole lot of volcanoes in southeast Alaska. There's a lot of volcanoes other places in Alaska, but this is another one of those things that makes us so unique. We talked about the mountains, how they shoot straight up out of the water, very drastic angles. But as you can see here, these <coughs> mountains, or these landforms don't do that. They're more flat, they're more gradually sloping. So when you're traveling around Sitka, you'll see mountains of the mainland on one side, and you'll see the volcanoes on the other. Sitka is one of the only places in the world where you can see volcanic and glacial geology side by side. It's another one of those things that just makes us very unique. And those volcanoes are pretty cool. They have been either dormant or extinct for basically all of recorded history, but it turns out as of last year, the big one, the one that's snow-capped in the back, started to rumble. It's starting to wake up. So this is one of those things that, again, I could go on all day, I won't, but it's one of those things that um, is very interesting, very cutting edge, and in terms of geologic time, it still could be a very long time for anything actually happens with, uh, with this volcano. But it's starting to rumble. There's about six miles down, there's this flow of lava that's starting to occur that was not there previously. So Mount Edgecombe, the name of this volcano, is growing. It's getting bigger. So it's growing about four inches a year as of 2019. So Mount Edgecombe is now 3,202 feet tall. We're keeping a close eye on it. But anyways, people, people love volcanoes. And just another view of it from the town, from the main area. It's like, yeah. So what you're seeing here is Mount Edgecombe, our main volcano. And then there's a bunch more. So this is a one volcano. And then there's 
meow, 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 a bunch of extinct ones to the side. So it's really a volcanic field. There's a bunch of them. A lot of interesting geology going on there. Every now and again, I get a rock nerd on board that absolutely just wants to talk about the whole time. Bill's not getting it. <laughs> That's another angle for you. This is an island of the lava extrusion. So this is another volcanically formed beach with the volcano behind it, which is just so that's basically the main point of our tours. It's basically what we show people is we show them wildlife, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and along the way sometimes we see wacky, cool, strange, unexpected things. We see bear tracks. This is, okay, this isn't doing it justice. This is a jellyfish smack. You ever been in the middle of a smack of jellyfish before? All of these are jellyfish. Wow. And the more you look, the more you see them. All of these are jellyfish, which is pretty incredible. That was when the salmon run started to happen. Jellyfish are eating carrion, they're eating dead material, dead stuff, and the salmon, at the end of their life cycle, they die. And this is the cleanup crew. <laughs> and then, did anyone see this on Facebook last year by chance? Anybody? Okay, this was the wildest thing. This is one of my favorite stories about working up in Alaska on this boat. Does anybody know Jim Fry by chance? Know of the Jim Fry? Does it sound a little familiar to you? Okay. Last year, towards the end of my season, I don't remember when this was actually. Late summer? I don't remember when it was. Um, I get up front, I grab my welcome aboard the Sea Otter Express, folks, and I do my whole spiel and I say at the end of it something to the effect of like, I'm from Iowa, my captain's from Florida, my deckhand's from such and such. Okay, done with that. Letting everybody settle in. I walk to the back of the boat, and the guy is sitting, like, second to last row, flags me down and goes, hey, I'm from Iowa, too. And before I can get out where I'm from, he says, I'm from Winterset. Where are you from? <laughs> <laughs> and now I look like the me, too. <laughs> it was so, it was so cool. It was amazing. So this gentleman's name is Jim Fry. Um, so he grew up in Winterset. He went to school at the high school here in Winterset. He had all kinds of stories. His wife went to Simpson. Of course, he's a couple generations older than me. So he left the area before my family moved in here. So I did not have any interaction with this individual, but we walked the same halls in a lot of cases. I, I went to middle school, that old middle school before they changed, which is when he went to as well. So like, I don't know. It was just the coolest thing. And we spent the whole time back and forth, back and forth thing about about winter set in between Potter Spiels and Potter Spiels. And then at the end of the tour, he wanted to take this photo with me. And then he posted it on the, if you're probably from winter set, if page, before I could even get off the clock and get back to my house to change, mom is already texting me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I just saw this <laughs> I didn't have time to think before I was already out there. It was so cool. It's just amazing how you find people how, you, how you're touched in all corners of the world with something like this. It was very special. So then, at one point, a less incredible story, but still cool, is that another couple was from Cumming, Iowa, that was on the boat, and I, again, had done that. I'm from Iowa, and then they said, where are you from? Winter said, we're from Cumming, that's crazy. And then they went, anybody know my sister, Megan? Okay, so I'm one of three, Megan's the youngest. Megan worked at, but you do. Megan worked at Baumgars last year, and she was cashing people out. I don't even know how the conversation ensued, but they said something about how they went on a on a an Alaskan cruise, and she's like, "Oh, that's crazy! My sister works in Alaska. Where? Sitka? We want a tour in Sitka. Oh, we might know your sister." <laughs> and I distinctly remember these people from coming. They had told me they're from coming, and then they can check one of them out in my phone. Right now. <laughs> how crazy! It is a small, small world. So, this is what I did. This was my career. Uh, or this was this was a job, I should say, that had become a career. Um, so a couple days before my birthday this year, I got a call from an Allen Marine executive inviting me to become Allen Marine's naturalist coordinator. So I coordinate all naturalists in all ports across everything we do. I'm going to be hiring them for next year, working on their training program. I am wildly excited to do it, which is why I stand up here with the same tag, and it went, which is why I'll be going back to Alaska over the winter. Um, but anyway, so then I got to experience the rest of the summer just lollygagging before that happened. But this is this is something that started on a whim that became a career. Um, so I do have other pictures and things. I've got all kinds of fun like stories about like you know things I did off the clock and everything like that. But this is the time I just wanted to open up if you've got questions about anything specific or if you want to hear about something specific. I gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Those volcanoes are they part of that? 
they got the ring of fire. Yes, they here. sure are. Yep, absolutely. So, <laughs> anybody heard of the ring of fire before? Mm -hmm. So, if I were to pull up a map, it's a very obvious ring that goes around from the tip of South America all the way up the Pacific coast through, of course, Mexico, and then you've got California, Oregon, Washington, mm -hmm. up into Alaska and around. So, yes, absolutely. We sit on that as, I'm just going to use my hand. For <laughs> this. Like, yes, that rim is right there next to us. For some odd reason, there aren't a whole lot of volcanoes in Southeast specifically. I'm not entirely sure why that is. I know there's a lot of side faults that come through in that area, which is why Southeast has so many islands. Um, so there's something about the way the tectonic plates have interacted that just makes for not a lot of volcanoes. Um, but up further, so as you get up into Seward and then out into the Aleutian chain, there is a plate that's grinding northward right now, bumping into another one, and there's a big subduction fault there. Subduction faults are where you see volcanoes. There's a crap load of them out in the Aleutian <laughs> chain. Um, but basically, in, yeah, in Sitka, we've got one of those rare volcanoes that popped up where we are. So most of the time, when you're looking at a volcano, you're looking at a subduction fault, where one plate is being pushed underneath of another one. And in Sitka, the fault that we've got is a transform or a slip fault, which means the plates are grinding past one another. They're bumping shoulders. There's no overlap. They're just bumping. So the fact that we've got a, a volcanic field in Sitka is pretty unique. It's one of those things for a volcanologist to study as a bit of an anomaly. That's a really good question. There was a major earthquake. I don't remember where it was. It happened yeah. back in the 70s. Mm -hmm. Is that in that area? Or you know? That one specifically was not. That was outside of Anchorage. Anchorage, Seward area, gets a lot more of them for exactly what I just described that they get bumped into. So a lot of those earthquakes and volcanic eruptions you're hearing are along, are along this part of things. Okay. And we really don't have a whole lot of them where we are. Well, we have it, but we might now. Potentially in the next couple of years. But yeah, most of the time we just get tremors. We haven't had a the last time we got a major earthquake, it was a 7.5 in 74, maybe. So a noticeable earthquake, but not too bad. The <coughs> fault line is about 15 miles west of Sitka. So Sitkins will feel it, but usually there's not damage from that sort of thing. Yeah. It's honestly a well situated town in terms of ge geography. Yeah. Well, this week. Well, this will be your first winter in Alaska. Yeah. <laughs> Where will you be working? Right? In Sitka. I'll be in Sitka. In Sitka. Oh, yeah. this. I'll be traveling a little bit for my job. I'll be traveling a little bit to all different ports, but yeah. my base will be Sitka. Does it kind of shut down during the winter? Definitely. Does the weather get kind mm -hmm. of... Definitely. Um, my last tour was yesterday. Um, two days ago. Just kidding. Two days ago. I did our last tour of the season was two days ago, and then we'll open it back up in April. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. The, the glacier that you had in one of the early uh, shots. Was yeah. that Columbia by chance? It was not. That's a great question. Okay, so this is one of those things. Uh, we'll go over this. I assume that's out of Whittier? So this right here is South Sawyer Glacier in Tracy Arm, which is out of Juneau. Yes. So this was along the way to get to Tracy Arm, the, uh, or excuse me, to get to the glacier. Tracy Arm is just a really big passageway. You travel through, it's about a six hour tour in total. It's about two and a half hours to get to the glacier. So along the way, you see all kinds of ice flows and waterfalls and is such. That's a taco? And then what's that? It's Tracy, it's called Tracy Arm. Tracy it's the name Arm. of the arm. And then the glacier at the end is called South Sawyer Glacier, which is connected to the Juneau Ice Field, yeah. the big old ice field. Yeah. And then uh, this is one of the most spectacular trips we've ever seen. <coughs> Do they dog sled up there during the winter and stuff? Or maybe and this one specifically, no. I'm not entirely sure why, other than it's very far out of the way. It's just not, you can't drive anywhere close to there. Helicopter even takes you a while. But the Mendenhall Glacier, do you know they do that? Yeah. Anybody been to the Mendenhall Glacier? Yeah, it's very accessible. It's very easy. You see puffins? Ah, that's a great question. Okay, so there's only one place that we ever saw puffins, and it was this island, which is called St. Lazaria. So if I were to show you, I know I should have. Okay, so this is a map of where I did tours. This is the Sitka Sound. This is the town of Sitka where we lower up, as my Midwestern dad would say. And then St. <laughs> Lazaria is all the way out here. It's about 15 miles west of town. So this is the volcano we've been talking about right next to it. So it's all the way at the far end. It's about an hour to get out there. So there are puffins that nest out there because the, um, the lava rock, when it hardens, just makes these shelves that are perfect for a place to nest. And the volcanic soil is just great. It's great nesting material. It's a national wildlife refuge. It's a great place to go, but we can't always get out there just because of the nature of the sea and such. So it's always special when we do. You see tufted puffins out there mainly. The northern puffins are more north, I guess. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. But yeah, that's a great question. And it's great, great puffin footage just because they're difficult to see a camera. But yeah, that's a great question. When's the best time of year to visit? Oh my gosh, that's a great time, great, great, great question. Um, it depends what you want to see. 
and it depends on your budget, and it depends on how many people you want to deal with. So the touristy answer would be to give you June, July, August. Um, I would tell you that I gave a fabulous tour experience to people two days ago in October. That's a wild card. It's not always that great. But I would recommend that if you're on a budget but you still want to see Alaska, that May and September are both fantastic in their own ways. May is when the gray whale migration is coming through. So there's dozens and dozens of gray whales. Not humpbacks, but there's dozens of grays. Um, the snow is still in the mountains. And then September is when the whales haven't left yet, but most of the large numbers of tourists have. So, <laughs> there's a great one. Yeah. Talk about the light. Did, wasn't it in oh, daylight and nighttime? Yeah, yeah, very much so. This is one of those things that you can people can tell you about it all you want, but you really just need to go experience it. So if you've lived in Alaska, no. It is such a mind meld. It's so weird. Okay, so in June, and so I'm pretty far south, of course, as far as Alaska goes. So I don't get the most extreme of it. Places like Nome and Barrow, all the way up there, they do get 24 hours of daylight, and they do get 24 hours of darkness. I'm not quite that extreme where I was. So I got about 18 hours of daylight, and we'll get 18 hours of darkness in December, which I won't be there for, but. Um, but even the times where it does get dark, don't get completely dark. So in the middle of June, when you walk outside at one or two in the morning, it's still hazy. It's still like the sun has just dipped below the horizon, and it's just a haze, exactly. It's like, it's, it never gets completely dark even at that time. So blackout curtains are a must in the summertime. <laughs> and it's hard, it's really, it is, it's hard to get to bed at night. I mean, you can't, the sun sets at 10. You it's adjust. Like, after, after you do, while. absolutely, absolutely. So seasonal people, I should say, have a really hard time with it when they come up there and they haven't done Alaska for a while. But yeah, absolutely you would. And then in the winter time, it's the converse, which I haven't done yet, which I'm nervously excited for this winter. I have to keep a lot of lights on. But yeah, I mean, that is certainly an adjustment up there. Yeah. Any other questions? I've got, I've got stories, but I'll tell you, don't worry. <laughs> Did you hear about those whales? I don't remember what time when that was with the three whales that were trapped up there in rural Alaska. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it was just where they had, and the, it was a female, a male and a female uh -huh. that they were trapped five miles in, in the Barrow. Why, what trapped them? Was it natural or was it human? Oh, gosh. And they had to get it up from Minnesota, mm -hmm. some ice company. Uh, that went through ice, mm -hmm. and they would make a section and then another section five miles out oh. of the inlet where they get come up and get air. Yeah. Come up and get air. Mom and dad. And That's so cool. Put the baby oh. But it's a true story. There's a movie. It's very, if you're, Have you all heard this story? Very mm -hmm. interesting. That is very cool. I've not heard that. Yeah, I'll have to look that up. The three of them. I don't remember what they were talking about. Really? We, okay, we should talk about Talk more about that after this. That's really interesting. Yeah, I would like to hear that. It's, it's really cool. Mm -hmm. And they all come together and try to save these whales. Oh, yeah. Alaskans do love their whales, though. Drew Barrymore was in the movie. We could have our own urban We've got a movie to go watch. You've got a movie to go watch. Great. Thank you. Cool. What were you going to say, Grandma? Um, well, I think that's kind of Back when your mother was a little girl, I had a friend from Alaska. And she said she was an alley -oot because she was from the Aleutian Islands. Yeah. And I wondered, are there other, well, I, I thought she was a native Alaskan. Me. I thought it made sense to me. Yeah. Are there other groups of people up there? That is a wonderful question. That is one of those things, another one of those topics that would take a really long time. I'm gonna give you a very short version. There's, I believe, 13 distinct native tribes in Alaska. I would have to check myself on that too. 13 distinct regions of native tribes. Yes, and most of them are still alive and well and practicing to this day. Um, so you've probably heard the term Eskimo, and then you might have heard the term Eskimo is a cringy term. There are, it's the same as the word Indian. It's one of those things that some people are very afraid of and don't want to identify with, and some people do identify with it as their culture. It's another one of those situations. Um, so I always ask people what they would prefer to be called before I do anything else, just like all of us are learning to do at the same age in that same sort of way. Yeah, there's quite a few of them. There's that, there's the Yupiak, there's the, I mean, there's, there's all kinds. In Southeast alone, there's the Haida, the Clinket, and then there's a tribe called Metlakatla. Anybody been to Metlakatla before? Did you go on your cruise? It's the only Native American reservation in Alaska. There are no other reservations. So one of the things I think it's interesting that Alaska did very well was where they, they, the way that they went about the native people that are already there and have been for so long. 
So instead of shoving them to the side, putting them on their own land and saying, leave us alone, most of the time, the indigenous culture is completely embedded in the community. And Sitka is a great example of that, of a place where the culture is indivisible entirely from, so the, like Sitkins are both Tlingit and non-Tlingit people. They're all, I mean, it's all completely the same. So you'll see all kinds of Tlingit members of, you know, city council and on the boards for different things. And it's like completely all together as one thing which I think is special. So in town, you'll see all kinds of native signage and verbiage and um, uh, totem poles and stuff. Um, schools are still very much practicing indigenous culture too. So yeah, that's a great question. And there are, I wanna say it's 13, I would have to check that, but they're in different regions throughout the state of Alaska. Do you know the answer to that? Again, how many there are? In Pacific, just wondering, just wondering. Okay, cool, I'll look that up for you. Yeah, and, there, and most of them are still alive and well today, which is why we talk about those native exemptions for um, like for hunting and harvesting, things like that. Those things are in place because there are people today that still would like to practice the way they have a thousand years. Has anybody heard of James Mishner's Alaska, the book? You need to read it. That book is fantastic. I'm in the middle of it right now. It tells you a lot about the way Alaska has evolved from that. Any other questions? Because I've got all kinds of things, but I was kind of going to tailor it to what you're interested in. I, okay, so Alaska is one of those places where you can forage for just about anything. And like most people who come up, I did a lot of fishing up there. These are silver salmon. Yes, I ate them. Yes, I ate them. <laughs> we found flounder. We found rockfish. We found black cod, um, sculpin. I mean, just like the fishing up there is incredible. If you are a fisherman, like, give it a whirl. It's so fun. Rachel. Yes, sir. I see you just have a hook there. What, what sort of bait do you use for those? We use lures. Just say we oh, want bait. Oh, just lures. We just had oh, lures, okay. and they were biting like crazy. I know, isn't that surprising? We were just out in a kayak this day randomly for an hour after work and caught probably 30 fish. It was a long time. Or even if you hate fishing. Yeah. Fishing is fun at It's fun. It's not like up here where you cast your bobber, you crack one open and you don't think about it for a while. You know, you like it's so it's fun because it's adventurous, because there's frankly there's a lot of fish in the sea out there. And yeah, yeah. You should you should give it a try. Yeah. Not fishing, but catching. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A lot of catching up in Alaska, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Caught a lot of that. There's also a lot of crabbing. In my specific area where I was, there's a lot of dungy nest crab. So I do have friends with crab pots. We go out, we just pull a crab out of the water and go into the pot, and there we went. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. This, is, this is really an advertisement to get you to Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell everybody, Rachel. You should fill up. I'm, oh, yeah, you're right. Okay, I'm just going to keep it a secret. <laughs> One of my other favorite things that I did this summer is, has anybody heard of Chicken of the Woods before? Yep. Chicken yeah. of the Woods. Allegedly, we have it here. Have you seen it here? Mm -hmm. Anybody seen it? You have. Okay. I've eaten it. You have. That's wonderful. Okay. I knew it existed. I've never seen it around here. That's very cool. Okay. We're going to go mushroom hunting next year. But I found so much of it in Alaska, which was one of the most, I don't know, it's a... To be able to forage your own food is pretty special. Yeah. We found, if there's a season, there's about three weeks in September where it's everywhere. It covers everything. It's incredible. And you know how, like, with your morel spots, you don't tell anyone where your morel spots are. You just, you just like, find it on someone's counter, and they're not going to tell you where they found it. Thank you. Know, <laughs> this is one of those. So we cooked it up, and we made pasta. We made chicken sandwiches. We made all kinds of stuff out of this. So one of my favorite things that I did this summer was just, like, pulling things out of nature and throwing them on a stove. It, just the coolest thing ever. So this is one of those that I really found enjoyable. And then the same with berry picking. Um, these are salmon berries. So there's quite a few different berries you'll find up there. There are wild strawberries, blueberries, huckleberries, cloudberry, bugberry. There's just a bunch. But salmon berries are just fun because they're beautiful. Look at this bright gold color, this bright red color. They're like a raspberry, a little bit bigger with a little less strong taste to them. I made jam last year with it too. Just like, it's just I don't know. You're basically a bear out there in the. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. So that was another one of those things I just found really fun. I just really enjoyed it. A bear. Bother you when you're picking those? Awesome question. Um, I had that in Canada. Did you really? Okay, so knock on every piece of wood that I can think of, I did not have a wild run in with a bear. <laughs> at all. Um, I had one time where I thought maybe I heard one. Maybe. And I started screaming and I never heard it again. <laughs> so basically the the way that me and my friends go about it is if you're going to hike by yourself, you bring a speaker, you play music, or you play a podcast. 
or you just go with friends and you talk the whole time. The best deterrent of affairs is the human voice. So no, I did never have an issue with it, although I was always cognizant. You bring your bear spray, you do your best. I don't believe in bear bells, that's just my personal opinion. I don't think that bells actually scare bears off. I like it actually. <laughs> but, but the human voice is the best way to warn them. So yeah, I never had an issue. <laughs> that was <so> very interesting. <laughs> exactly. Oh, that's not wood. Oh man. I learned that mariners are very superstitious. I did not know that. I had a captain last year that would not let me bring a single banana on that boat. Oh, no. I wouldn't do it. Something about okay. So the thing with bananas is that they make fruit next to them ripen faster. So hypothetically speaking, like pirates used to be like used to not want bananas on their boat because they would make all the fruit go bad. So it's just a really old thing that my, I had a very seriously had a captain completely unsarcastically say, you will never bring a banana on this boat if you want to do it. Yeah. Anyways, now I knock on wood all the time. Um, I did go snorkeling at one point. My wonderful parents mailed up my wetsuit, and I did go snorkeling for my birthday, which is all I really wanted to do with myself. Found a bunch of abalone. I'm sure you're familiar with abalone in some way, shape, or form. We have pinto abalone up in uh, southeast. So they're not as big as the red ones you see in California, but they're closely related and they're beautiful. I brought one back for each of my fam. Uh, just a lot of, the, the inner tidal, just um, uh, tide pooling is, I don't know, you gotta try it sometime. <laughs> the kids are all out there, you know, we creek stomp around here and they go tide pooling out there, it's just a thing. A lot of waterfalls chase. I must tell you, TLC told me not to, but I chased them. <laughs> and then we talk about this. Tracy Arm, there's a couple different tours we offer that go to um, uh, cool locations rather than being wildlife focused, and this is one of them. So there's not a wildlife guarantee on this tour, and again, it's based on Juno. You know, it's a six hour tour. You might see wildlife along the way, but the whole point is to get to South Sawyer Glacier at the end, which was a very, very cool tour. Very laid back. People do sleep sometimes on that one, and that's it. But yeah, so that, that was a very special event. If you ever go to Juno, you should give it a whirl. And then just more like fun pictures from the whole situation. I, Fire Read is one of my favorite planes in the world. I've got it on my phone. I, I just absolutely adore it. It's, it's the, a very cool plant. So Fire Read starts blooming in June and late June, depending on the year. And then it starts blooming from the bottom of the plant. So the bottom part blooms one month, the middle blooms the next month, the top blooms the next month, and then when it's bloomed out, it's like a sign of the end of summer. But it's just kind of a cool like timeline for your season. Um, and then I went to the Alaska State Fair this year in Palmer, Alaska, which is up just a little north of Anchorage. And I just thoroughly enjoyed the fairs go next to the mountains because we do love our Iowa State Fair around here. It's cool. Theirs is not as cool as ours. <laughs> but it's not as big as ours, I should say. But I don't know, it's a, a cute little state fair. The pumpkins are bigger. The pump you are right about that. Okay, yeah. so of course there's lots of light up in Alaska, so the plants go batty for it. As you could imagine, there's so much light, the plants get huge. And yeah, they have all those like largest veggie contests and things and they they're I mean off the wall, they're huge, which is very fun. Yeah. That fire weed where you were at, did they make jelly out of that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I brought some home last year. I brought fiery honey home for yeah. the fair. That's and where we were when it was August. Yeah, yeah. And but fiery's got this just gorgeous magenta color. I, it's okay. So, did anybody know the Alaska State flower? <coughs> Little blue. Yeah, little blue. You got it. It's called the forget me not. <laughs> but you all forgot it. <laughs> <laughs> you won't know. Uh, but hey, but uh, fiery is easily a close second. It's very much a you know hallmark of, of Alaska, which I saw all throughout. Yeah. And then I went on a seaplane tour, just just like more views. This is a marine lake, so this would be a, a glacially, you know, a glacially fed lake. Do whatever you can. Just do what I say. And then, yeah, that's kind of the end of my formal um, content that I had prepared and ready for you. This is a photo I took myself at the back of our company housing. Can you imagine living in a place where they put you up in that? That's pretty cool. Um, and I had. I don't know, I have one more story to share. I don't know if anyone's gonna be interested in it. But anyways, but this is the end of my formal. Okay, so there was one time. I jumped on myself. But basically, um, one time at the beginning of last season, we heard, we got a, a call that a dead whale had washed up on one of the smaller islands. So Sitka Sound area has a bunch of very tiny islands and places for debris to get washed up on. So a dead whale had washed up one of the beaches. 
Well, that was irresistible. So I kayaked out there with a couple of friends that day. Uh, it's about four miles outside of Zipka. It was a very long kayaking trip. It was a lot of fun. And we went and visited this dead whale. We got to get up close and personal with just a lot of like the features of what it, a lot, a lot of ways you can look at a whale that you wouldn't be able to just by watching it casually. So it was very interesting in a lot of ways. I have pictures. It is not grotesque, I promise you. It's a little bit weird, but it's not grotesque. Can I show them? Will yes. anyone freak out? You can tell me no, this is the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna show you. Oh, wow. Oh, baby. So by the time we got to it, it was a solid couple weeks to Kate, so it was past the cool gas stage, so it really was not. <coughs> Um, the rocks were completely covered in blubber, so it was starting to melt eventually. Mm -hmm. And then you could see the baleen in this whale very well. Mm -hmm. Has anybody heard of baleen before? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you totally know it. Okay, baleen is what a humpback whale has in its mouth instead of teeth. Mm -hmm. So you and I have teeth made of calcium that are there throughout our lives and they, they bite stuff. Humpback whales have baleen, which is instead filtering things out of water. So they're not biting, they're filter feeders. So, baleen is hundreds and hundreds of plates in a whale's mouth that are, make up this filter feeding system. And this is just a really cool way to get an idea of how it works. So, the baleen is only on the whale's upper jaw. Humpback whales have a smaller upper jaw, larger lower jaw. It seems counterintuitive, right? You'd think the, up, the upper jaw would be bigger. Flip it. This is the lower jaw bone here. So that's, and there's another one on the other side. But the upper jaw here, you can see, has all this stuff that looks like hair. It looks very hairy to it. So all, all these, there's hundreds and hundreds of plates like this. Up to 400 plates in a humpback whale's mouth. So, um, so the idea is that humpback whale's lower jaw has all these ventral pleats, all these folds of skin, so that whale's going to get a big old gulp full of seawater and blows all these up like a bullfrog when it rivets. The lower jaw, full of water, close its mouth most of the way, and push seawater back out between the plates of baleen. So all the plates of baleen themselves, again, they're running like this, and there's all of these bristles on one side of the plates. So the bristles from the inside, they're all like tangled up together, like a, like a net. And then when the whale pushes seawater back out between them, the net holds on to food on the inside of the whale's mouth while seawater comes back out. Whales cannot swallow seawater, just like people. It would make them sick. So this is the solution they've evolved over time for that. This means humpback whales eat tiny food. What does a humpback whale eat? Krill. Plankton. Krill. Plankton. Man. Small schooling fish as well, like a young salmon, young herring fry. Krill's their favorite, which means when they go to the restaurant, their favorite thing to order is a grilled cheese sandwich. <laughs> So when they're ingesting that, thank you, thank you. when they're ingesting that grilled cheese sandwich, this is how they do it. For that reason, humpback whales' throats can only swallow things about the size of a grapefruit, <coughs> which is pretty odd, isn't it? Because they're huge. So that whale could not swallow a sea lion or sea otter. Or you. Nor would they want to. And that was probably one of my absolute favorite things. So fun fact, at the end of that day, the tide was going back out, and there's blubber all over the rocks, very slippery, and the surf was back and forth, back and forth, beginning in my kayak, and I lost my phone that day. Oh. And that was the first two times that I'd broken or lost a phone in Sitka. But it was a great experience nonetheless, and my friend sent me these photos. So this is a juvenile humpback whale. It probably wasn't a, uh, a fully grown one. This one's probably about 30 feet long. Humpback whales can get up to 55 feet long, oh, wow. which is huge. Any idea what happened to it? This one, oh, I'm going to answer that question. It's a National Geographic level answer. Yes, we do know what happened to it. Because you'll notice that the whale is pretty much intact, except for its back, or its fluke, its back flipper is a little bit mangled up, and its lower jaw is completely gone. Anybody heard of killer whales before? Mm -hmm. Heard of orcas before? Mm -hmm. Orcas, killer whales, they're the same thing. Orca, orcas hunt in a uh, like a wolf pack type of hunting strategy. So lots of orcas can overtake a larger predator. The same way that wolves would take down a you know, something or a bison, something bigger. Um, so we know this was an orca attack because just the lower jaw is missing. Because orcas love to eat or humpback whale tongues. Oh, it is a favorite of theirs. Uh, so we know that partially because the fluke was. Um, ripped up because it was being pursued. Mm -hmm. And then 
Yeah, yeah, the only thing that was really missing or gone from this whale was the lower jaw. So there's no way that would have been a like a human sort of thing. Or anything like that. Any creature on land that would have been eating this animal would have eaten everything equally. Yeah. So yeah, so that's pretty interesting. Um, so I had a hum, um, a friend that was on that trip with me that put a bunch of um, trail cameras out that day that we went out there, and then went back and looked at the trail cameras later. And the bears had, sorry, they had ripped apart the carcass and they had taken out all the baleen and they'd made a den out of it. So they'd used all these plates, hundreds and hundreds of plates. It's hard to fathom here, but you see all these, all those plates, and they had made a den out of it. They made this whole big structure to the side where they had been like sleeping while they were out there on the island eating. Hmm. What? What? <laughs> <laughs> so he won't share those photos with me because he wants them for his photography business. He wants to know what? But I got these done. No one says, I didn't know what sort of audience I was going to get tonight, so I didn't know if this was something that I should share. But it's very cool, probably one of the highlights, easily one of the highlights. And that was right about an hour, which I'd say is pretty cute. <laughs> How often do you get up north? Thank you for listening. Um, I go out for the season and pretty much don't leave throughout the season. So the, I, no, mean, I mean oh. north. Oh, like Anchorage and above. Oh, I understand. Okay, so because you're southeast. You are. I am. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, so when I was in Seward, I didn't really go anywhere, and then last year I didn't go anywhere at all. This year I planned a trip specifically because I hadn't seen enough of Alaska. So I went up to Denali, that's the furthest north I went was Healy this year. Which is still, again, all the way back to this, I, like, Alaska is such a huge place because look where Denali is. Like here. Yes. There's so much more of it, you know? Yeah. So anyways, it's on my bucket list to get out further north. I, I had a friend that's going to Barrow at some point next year, and Barrow is one of the most, like, far up there ones. But anyways, so. So where's the idea to run? The Iditarod started in Sitka, or excuse me, in Seward. It started in Seward, down here, and then goes up and over from there into the Yukon. But the original Iditarod was started in Seward, right? It goes up and over, doesn't it? Yep. And it goes down. Were you familiar yeah. with that Susan Butcher from Iowa? Mm-hmm. Did she? Susan Butcher? Does anybody know this person? Yeah. She's from Iowa? She's from Iowa. Oh, I didn't know she was from Iowa. She was up there racing when we were living up there. Went for a ride with her. You did? Oh, yeah. cool. Wow. Well, your presentation? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Now, we've been all over Alaska. Yeah, yeah. We had yeah, two sure. sons who lived there and both have passed away. But yeah. We have grandchildren there. And we've been to... You talked Nome. about Barrow. Barrow. Uh, Barrow is really a long ways from where you are. Yeah. But mm-hmm. our son played football there grandson. a couple of years. A grandson mm-hmm. played football there a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. Was a high school long. football game. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And uh, he talked about the guys at Eve all, all around the football field with yeah. the guns. Mm-hmm. I've colored rifles too. For me, what are bears. they for? <laughs> Up and down. Yeah. Because they have popcorn. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Just a short outside of that, we watched John Carson and a woman. She was from the state. She went up there to visit. She fell in love with it. And it's a girl. And she's just my gosh. You know, so she opens up a Mexican restaurant. And she's not Mexican or anything like that. Everybody flies in the you know, and he was talking about uh, how expensive it was, like just for containers, to go containers, yeah. because everything had to be flown in. Mm-hmm. And so we're, and she married a, one of the indigenous people that were yeah. there, and she said, I don't have to worry about yeah, sure. having a chef because he's my husband. And anyway, it was yeah. hilarious. And then when we watched the movie about saving the whales, yep. here they are at this <gasps> Mexican oh, restaurant. Oh, <laughs> oh my gosh. gosh. Oh my gosh, again, such a small world. That's so fun. Oh man, that's awesome. Okay, so I'm going to try. Oh, yeah, come on. I just wondered what it was like to meet up with your fifth grade teacher. <laughs> that was so fun. Okay, so I knew I was going back to Alaska, frankly, as soon as I left last year. And then I think you had told me you were going up like right before I left like two a week before I left for Alaska for the season. I don't know. I remember you telling me like the end of the semester or something like that. Yeah. And then and then yeah and I kind of forgot about it until Jen texted me. I was like, oh my gosh, they're gonna be here, they're gonna be here, oh my gosh. 
And then, yeah, so we, we got lunch, and I showed them around town. We just buzzed around the town of, the bustling town of Sitka. There's only 14 miles of road in Sitka, by the way. So you can cover it all very quickly. <laughs> but we got <laughs> in front of her house. And yeah. Her. Just like a good shipyard and all over the place. There's this really great picture that she got of me with my arms outstretched yeah. across the sound, schooling Jim in something. <laughs> I'm telling him something. And here he is, hands on hips, and the beautiful the sound of the volcano behind us and all. I'm sure I was giving him a post story. But yeah, it was very fun, very cool, very rewarding. Um, just the fact that like that people like you in this room are interested in something like this is pretty special because I this is just a really big journey that I've taken from being the little farm girl in Iowa to being my last Mariner. And yeah, so I mean that was one of those moments that made me realize, oh wow, I've come a long way. <laughs> Price wise, can you give us some prices? Yeah, I can. I mean, I, just ballpark, whatever. Okay, I'm gonna try. So Sitka is along the Alaska Marine Highway. Um, Okay, it's not going to show. Um, the Alaska Marine Highway system hits pretty much all of these ports on its way up. So it's a barge cargo that comes up on a big ship from Seattle. So it's not like we're getting all of our things flown in. Of course, there's not a semi truck that's bringing us things. It's coming by barge. So what you got is what you'll have for a week or so at any given time. So if you run out, all the grocery stores run out of milk at the same time. All of them run out of eggs. It's not like you can drive to Des Moines and go get some. So that's pretty interesting. When they had the egg shortage last winter, that was pretty interesting. I heard, I wasn't there, but I heard people. So because of that, and just being so remote, the prices are up there for sure. I'm trying to think of something I can give you an answer to. Um, gas was $5.75 a gallon, which isn't a whole lot more, but it's definitely more. I didn't buy a lot of gas. Um, we got 14 miles of road. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So how big are you going to go? It's going to last you. I'll roll here for the big thing. Um, <clears throat> let me think of something I can actually give you. The prices, just general living prices, are definitely steeper. Um, I don't know if I could give you a price for anything I'm thinking of. Bread, I'm thinking of, gallon of milk. Okay, I did buy a lot of gallons of milk. Bread was probably six bucks a loaf, seven mm. bucks a loaf. It wasn't, I would say it was like 30% more expensive, but it adds up. Let's put it that way. It definitely. Like but there's no sales tax. That's true. That's not no income tax. tax. Okay, so there you go. So maybe it does even out a little bit at the end of the day. And you make a little, you earn a little more, you but you also spend a little more. Did you do the PFD system when you were up there? Ma'am? Did you do the PFD system when you were up there? PFD. With the, like, uh, every year you get, like, Oh, the personal fund yeah. yeah. We took it for a couple of years, and once we relocated to Washington mm -hmm. State, even though I was a resident my entire 20 years, mm -hmm. active duty, I stopped claiming it because oh. once I bought my first house, mm -hmm. I was like, eh, that's like cheating the state. But there were people who would go up every year. Mm -hmm. They'd spend two weeks in Alaska, get their permanent fund dividend check for every kid in their family, yep. them included. Yep. It was good money. It, yeah. But the state started coming back after people after a while. Yep. If you that's didn't have intent to return, mm -hmm. they came back after some military folks mm -hmm. and said, hey, mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I it bet. Yeah, okay, so a personal fund dividend. This is Talk basically, uh, you might be able to explain it better. Oil kickbacks. It's oil, yeah, it's oil money that's given back to people that live up in Alaska as full time residents. So it's done every year. You have to be a resident for a full year before you can start to get it, right? And then, and then yeah, you go from there. So, anyway, so there are, I guess, a couple of financial uh, perks. Yeah, perks. Yeah, absolutely, for being there. And yeah, and Sitka wasn't what I would call. I don't know. It was expensive, but it wasn't exponentially more. It's probably equivalent to like a larger city on the west coast or something like that. In terms of how that's a good one. Yeah, Jim. Very terrible man. I just, I mean, we we throw a shout out to your company, the Adam Marine. You know, the reason we met you up there was because we were we already booked a cruise mm -hmm. on your company, and and but we were able to hook up and meet with you that day. Um, but I would. I would highly recommend them. If we got on a 70 passenger ship and there was only 40 of us on there, the lady that took that nice photograph, she was a professional mm -hmm. photographer that happened to be one of us. And, but anyway, you can take six day cruises and you get three really good meals mm -hmm. and you don't have to get on a ship with 3,000 other people. Mm -hmm. 
and we really get to see the inside passage. Your company was just awesome. I'm glad you say that. Uh, we were voted in Forbes, I want to say recently, for best small cruise, small cruise line in Alaska. Um, I'm glad you say that. Yeah, so Allen Marine Tours is the day boat tours, and there's another part of our company, another piece of the company called Alaska Dream Cruises. So that's what Carol and Jim went and experienced. And they are, yeah, they're small passenger vessels that do um, a week at a time, something like that. And they do, they have a lot of expedition options on those ships. So they do go out, you know, they take Zodiac boats out to get closer to glaciers. They take, you know, kayaks and they've got hiking options and things like that. If you wanted a more adventurous cruise experience. And so they go all the way up and down the Inside Passage. They, they do a lot. They're a very cool way to travel if you're interested in that sort of thing. Um, I get a family and friends discount. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, hello, friends. So, yeah, yeah. I'm glad they think. Now you tell me. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Yeah, that's coming June. That's ours. Uh, yeah, so for next time. You got a big promotion after we saw you. Yeah, I did. Yes, yeah, so that was a big deal. That was um, very unexpected. It was the best week of my life. That birthday and everything else. It was cool. How's your cell coverage? Oh, okay, so in Alaska, they've got GCI. You know GCI. You familiar with GCI? No? Okay, so GCI is... We were a long time ago. Okay. <laughs> GCI, I want to say it's affiliated with He wants to be on the program, does he? I want to say AT&T affiliation. So GCI is just an Alaska company that does cell service things. So GCI, if you live up there all the time, it's a great deal. Well, I'm in the middle at the moment. I have Verizon, and Verizon was, for the most part, pretty darn good. Really? Good. Yeah, it really was. Um, anything else? Go get about it. You're not going to get it. Especially when there's three cruise ships in town with mm. 5,000 people bumping off one hour. <laughs> Plug in. <laughs> but yeah, the beauty of that whole cruise ship industry, though, is that people leave at night. So at night, it wasn't, it wasn't a big issue. But yeah, some coverage was not too bad, depending on where you were in town. And yeah, and how many people were on. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah, so okay, so one more time. Do you just want to plug Alaska Dream Cruises if you are interested, if you know anyone that's interested in taking one of those trips. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out, I don't know if anyone in this room is looking for a career change in their life. But, um, <laughs> I put this up here. Okay. I put this up here because we are hiring for next season. Um, I am doing the hiring for our naturalist next year. Now, there are also plenty of other opportunities. If you know someone that has always wanted to work on a boat, they could learn to be a deckhand, and being a deckhand is a great way to learn to become a, a captain. Um, you could very easily get your captain's license in a few short years. You could take courses through Allen Marine. They will pay for it if you work for us. Um, so deckhand, captain options. If you've got someone who needs a summer job, we have guest service opportunities on our larger boats, which is basically a concession stand person. The person that stands in the galley, they sell you your coffee and your chocolate bars, things like that. It's a great way for a young person to get an experience that's different without needing a whole bunch of credentials or anything like that. Just some way to get out. Um, if you know someone who you think might make a good naturalist, you will know they're a good naturalist, not because they are batty about rocks necessarily, but because they're passionate about people and they are adventurous and they like to chatter. More often than not, our best naturalists are people that have some sort of theater experience or some sort of uh, performance type of experience. So take a picture of my socials and my contact information, take it with you and please holler at me if you know anyone in your life that is interested. I would be more than happy to uh, talk with anyone if they want more information, if they want more details. I should have put our, oh, I should have put our uh, Alan Reed, um, our website on there. You honestly can look up Allen Marine Tours and you'll find it online if you're interested in that. Um, but we are on the cusp of our hiring for next year and I would absolutely love to welcome some ambitious Winter Cityans up there. <laughs> that would be really cool. That would be very special. I have a couple of friends of mine that are from the Midwest up there that are, yeah, that are, uh, yeah, same experience I had where they grew up in one place and made a big old life change and just so, were you going to say something? Oh. What was the name of that book you said? It's really good. Oh, it's literally called Alaska by James Mishner. M I S C H N E R? I think it's just C H. Okay, M I C H N E R. Do we have it in our library? I don't. Oh. <laughs> and a book to print. Um, I have a book. Yeah, that's a great one. It's just called Alaska. It is. That's a great book. Oh, okay. One other thing I was going to say. Just in case you're curious, you all know the movie, The Proposal. 
Mm -hmm. Well, not filmed in sitcoms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was not filmed there. It was filmed in Maine and Massachusetts. Fun fact. Mm -hmm. Because they wanted to shut Sitka oh. down to film, oh. and Sitka said, we need tourism dollars. No, thank you. Um, but there is like a beginning scene from the, um, from the airport. So the, other, the way that you'll know that is you'll go back and watch the movie now that you've seen all these photos, yeah. and you'll say, that doesn't look quite the same. Yeah. And then you watch the scene where they're pulling lobster out of the ocean. We don't have any lobster in Sitka. Uh -huh. So that was literally. What about the reality shows about Alaska? There are definitely so Okay, so Deadliest Catch, you're familiar. Yeah. Definitely Deadliest Catch episodes filmed in Sitka. One of the tender boats, or it's called the Maverick. It was a fishing boat vessel in one of the episodes. It says, does tender work for us. So. Did you see a lot of that? Yeah, a lot of like documentaries and things. Our authenticity book. <laughs> Folks, this has been fantastic. I'm so glad you came to visit. Thank you so much. Take some for the road. Thank oh, Heather Riley and Judy oh, Fire for making all those. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. And if you have any specific questions or stories or anything, I will be here. So I'll be here for like a month or so. So if you anything, if there's anyone in your community that you want that you think would be interested in something like this, like give me a holler, please do. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.